the Meng Huang home, my reflect reflections living in the charming town of Los Gatos from 1959 to 1961, and later as an adult with my family and career. Thank you so much, Janet, for being here. Do you want to just say uh, your name and where and when you were born? Oh, okay. Uh, Janet Patricia Chang. Uh, my Chinese name is Jiang Silto, which is Jiang is our last name. We're really Jiangs. And Silto is what they tell me means smiling peach. Okay, <laughs> whatever that is. Okay, the historical context is the 1940s, World War II, the Japanese internment and discrimination in housing, employment, and schools. I was born in 1947 as a Chinese hospital in San Francisco. We lived with my maternal grandmother in Chinatown Public Housing. There were four adults and three children in a one-bedroom, one-bath apartment. Our family lived in a closet with one bed on each side of the narrow closet. On one bed, my sister, brother, and I slept horizontally. And on the other, my parents slept. My father was a merchant marine, and we only saw him every two years as his ship would circle the world. He was quite alarmed over the internment of the Japanese citizens. So in 1947, he made the bold move to move our family out of Chinatown to the one and only area that Chinese could purchase a home, the Bayview Hunters Point District. The move was a major shock to our family. In Chinatown, we could shop for groceries two blocks away on Stockton Street, and our church was on the next block. We were surrounded by our families, relatives. My mother and father spoke Chinese and English, but all of the children, including me, only spoke Chinese. When we started kindergarten, each of us had to learn English very quickly. The Bayview District was very different than Chinatown. The residents in the 1950s included Italians, other whites, Chinese, Filipinos, and Blacks. My mother and our family could no longer walk two blocks for groceries, but had to walk further or take the bus for groceries or to the doctors or back to Chinatown to visit our grandmother and relatives. Chinatown was a small, tight community, and for our family, it was safe and familiar. The Bayview Hunters Point was one of the poorest areas in San Francisco. It was the only area the Chinese could afford a home, buy a home. Our new neighborhood was not only different, in many ways it was hostile. Moving from Chinatown to the Bayview District was a major adjustment for our entire family. When I came to Ming Wong home in the summer of the fifth, after my fifth grade, my mother packed what few personal items I had in a brown Chiquita banana cardboard box. We took a long ride with a family friend, but no one told me where we were going. I was confused, but stayed silent. I wanted to cry. I recall driving through the tall wooden gate, Ming Huang home, and I said to myself, hmm, this is not camp. We walked around the grounds and stopped at one of the cottages. I recall the guide directing me to go outside and meet the other girls. I went outside, introduced myself, but the initial meeting did not go well. I returned to the cottage and was shocked that my mother had left without saying goodbye. I was further confused. Then at one end of a long hallway and at the other end reemerged a large woman with her hands behind her back shaking something. She did not say a word as she approached me, but I could see a brush that she then reviewed, revealed. I stood up to her and I said, you are not going to hit or spank me. If you do, I will kick and slap you back twice as hard. I will go to my room. I will miss dinner. I will not come out till tomorrow morning and then turned away and walked into my room. Decades later, I would later learn that I was the only one who was never spanked. No one, not my mother, nor the house mother, or the directors of the home, no one ever told me why I was sent there. What was I doing here, and when was I going home? During therapy sessions, I learned piece by piece why I was sent to the Meng Huang home. My mother was exasperated and embarrassed with my behavior at school. She was called twice to school due to my fighting. 
In Chinese families, to be called to school was the ultimate embarrassment to the family. She sought help with a social worker from Karen House, and then I was sent to the Ming Huang home. No one asked me why I fought. I fought because I was being bullied. I was shoved, kicked, called ugly, skinny, buck tooth, four eyes, and a chink. I knew I had to do something. I really only had to fight once. I just had to make it a good one so no one would challenge me again. I learned to yell really loud and smack the bully hard between the eyes. My bully would be stunned, in great pain, and with a bloody nose. Later, I would say to others who wanted to take me on, I do not want to get suspended. So when you walk home, look on all three corners. I will be there and chase your ugly ass down. Soon, no one challenged me. How long was I there? I arrived in the summer of 1959, and in 1961, I returned to my family in San Francisco. I attended Louise Van Meter Elementary School for sixth grade, and then to University Avenue for seventh and eighth. In 1961, my house mother told me not to go to school that day, but without an explanation. Later after breakfast, I was told to pack my belongings and that I was going back to my family in San Francisco. I did not have time to prepare leaving Ming Kwong. I did not have the opportunity to say goodbye to the other residents or the staff or my school friends or teachers. My arrival to the Ming Kwong home and my departure was equally abrupt. Well, what was my experience like? Each resident of the Ming Kwong home was there due to a wide range of reasons and circumstances. We later learned that some were orphans, some were children of single parents without the financial capacity to care for young children while faced with working the often extreme work hours associated with Chinese immigrant labor at that time. Other parents may have had mental or physical conditions that impacted their ability to care for their children. In 2008, I reunited with the Ming Huang residents and learned of the ledger for the date, their given name in English, parents' occupation, birthplace, reason for being replaced, and whom they were released to upon leaving the home was included. For some unknown reason, my name was not listed in spite of seeing other names who came after me and their names were recorded. For these children, the social services of the county did not accept Chinese children for their care. Ming Kuang and the Presbyterian Mission provided a safe place for Chinese children during a time of overwhelming anti-Chinese sentiment in California and across the United States. My daily life in Ming Kuang, everyone attended public schools, Louise Van Meter Elementary and University Avenue Junior High. There were two exceptions, a boy and a girl who were limited in their capacity to function in the mainstream school. And they had private teachers come to the school, come to the home for their schooling. We attended Sunday services at the Los Gatos Presbyterian Church on Chandler Road, and even went to overnight church camp at Mount Hermon. We picked fruit in the summer, visited the Los Gatos movie theater, stores, and parks. We shared common experiences with other Los Gatos children, but everybody knew we were from the home because we were the only Chinese American children in Los Gatos, visibly not the middle, like middle class dress, and we were living in a regimented Presbyterian mission home. During our time in Los Gatos, some of the girls experienced discrimination and intolerance, though it was not a prevailing factor in our daily lives. We had routine. After breakfast, we had our household chores before leaving for school. Prayers were an integral part of our evening activities following dinner. Sometimes we sang hymns or took turns reading a Bible story. Then the older girls, including me, would return to complete the kitchen cleanup duties and setting the table for breakfast the next day. The younger girls had free time to study their homework, play outside, write letters, or socialize until 8 o'clock. Summers in Los Gatos were divine. We had art classes, tennis and swimming lessons, and even baton lessons. And going to the movies were a treat. 
We would go camping at New Brighton Beach and day trips to the Santa Cruz Beach Boardwalk. Activities that if I had stayed in San Francisco, I never would have had. Sundays and holidays were memorable. Every Sunday, we would walk to church on Shannon Road, and we also participated in church youth groups. Parents and families of some of the children, some of the girls would visit the home. My mother, brothers and sisters never visited me. Once my father came to visit me and he brought me a pink transistor radio and apologized that he had, did not know what happened and asked, was I okay? I said I was fine. Other groups would take some of the girls out for lunch, trips or picnics. I was never invited. Easter and Christmas were both celebratory times at the home. Candy-filled Easter baskets were given to the girls and Ms. Reber would prepare a special meal for dinner after Easter church service. During Christmas, those girls who did not spend the holiday with family would go caroling through the neighborhood, help decorate a large tree in the main building living room and open presents on Christmas morning. Many of the gifts and special events were financed by local churches, friends of the church, and local university fraternities and sororities. I usually went home during those holidays and I only heard about the activities. Living in Los Gatos, on the first day of school, we lined up at the gate on the top of Loma Alta. When Miss Reber saw the yellow bus, she would ring her big school bell and everybody who was not in line came running from the cottages. I started the sixth grade at Louise Van Meter Elementary School. I did not know anyone. I wore secondhand clothes and brown shoes. I was awkward and scared. The teacher asked me to stand up and read a packet passage. I stood up, took a breath, and then read so fast that the kids thought I was speaking Chinese. After reading, I just sat down. The next day, I was assigned to a different room. I learned later it was a special education room. It was quite fun. No formal teaching, arts and crafts, a little music, and games. After a bit, I was sent back to the sixth grade. At recess, a freckle-faced girl asked if I wanted to play tetherball. It was fun and we became friends. In middle school, I was on the basketball and track team. In sports, I found a reason for attending school. In sports, I had teammates and developed skills and began to have confidence. So how did I feel about my Chinese heritage? The social and cultural context of racial and ethnic pride and diversity has shifted dramatically from the 1950s to today. Our family was immersed in the Chinese culture. We had Chinese food at home. In fact, my mother would pack Chinese tidbits in a cookie tin for my school lunch. We ate out only at Chinese restaurants and having a slice of pizza, 49 cents, at the downtown Woolworth store was my first taste of Italian food. There were probably two reasons we did not go to other restaurants. For one, we were very poor. And number two, for many restaurants, Chinese and other groups were not welcomed. We celebrated holidays like Easter, Christmas, but the biggest celebration were traditions with Chinese New Year. We would wash our hair and thoroughly clean the house the day before New Year's. The evening meal before New Year's was a vegetarian meal to show sympathy to the animals. On New Year's Day, we had our best behavior and we could not say a crossword or argue. That evening, we would meet family at a restaurant for a traditional New Year's Day dinner. At the end of the meeting meal, the children or anyone else who was not married would sit still and the adults would stand next to each child and the child would wish them a prosperous new year in Chinese. We would bow our heads and shake our class hands three times. The adult would hand us a red envelope with paper money in it, lacy. No one ever missed those dinners. San Francisco has neighborhoods. 
Chinatown North Beach the Marina. In the 1950s, it was generally known that Chinese would stay in Chinatown, except for the Bayview Hunters Point District. The district was quite diverse in the 1950s, and as the post War, World War II economic boom was exploding, the change came. There were whites, blacks, and Asians, but soon, before the mid 60s, many whites moved out to other areas of, law, of San Francisco. While scattered in the 50s and 60s, the residents were overwhelmingly white, upper middle class. All the residents of the home stood out because we were virtually the only non-whites, obviously poor, as most of us wore secondhand clothes and shoes. I never experienced direct racism in this cute little town. I was invited to friends' homes and birthday parties. Back in San Francisco, when I attended Pelton Junior High, the student population was few whites, mainly blacks and Asians of different ethnicities. For me, I did not think twice about my Chinese heritage. It was just part of our family. Attending Lowell High School became the slow awakening process of my personal identity as an Asian. The Lowell's population did not reflect the diversity of San Francisco. It was at least 85% white. One morning when I walked into school, the courtyard was almost empty. Oops, did I get the time right? Is it a holiday? Where is everybody? It was Yom Kippur. This was my first experience with a Jewish holiday. And I learned that 20 to 30% of the students were Jewish. I recall an incident in high, at a high school reunion. I was in conversation with Lanny Silver, probably the most well-connected graduate of our class. Through her work in developing and documenting stories from the Holocaust, she inspired Steven Spielberg to make the movie Schindler's List. Lanny and I had communicated over the years regarding our nonprofit work and raising the awareness of discrimination. During this particular conversation, a woman stepped up to me, tapped my arm, and stated, did I know you in high school? I resented her tone. However, I replied politely, well, we attended the same high school, and we were in the same class. She repeated her question, and this time in an annoying tone. I took a breath and said, in the social and cultural context of 1965, individually, we did not make a conscious effort of who to socialize with, as Catholics had their CYO, the Protestants had their YM or YWCA, many of the Jews had their temples, the Japanese had their basketball teams, etc. She did not like my history lesson and repeated her question even louder. I then answered her even louder than her question. Well, for your 16th birthday, many of the girls, especially the Jewish ones, had big, lavish parties, though I was never invited. I asked her, how many Blacks or Asians did you invite to your 16th birthday party? She scoffed. Everyone around was quiet. Lanny swiftly took my arm and we turned her back on the woman and we calmly walked away. And Lanny commented, yes, Janet, you were so correct. I never viewed our high school days in that context. When a reporter asked Lanny for a photo, she said only if Janet Chang could be included. Lanny was the epitome of inclusive. I miss her heart and her passion. The 60s propelled me into activism and overnight I became a hippie. March for the war, smoked, marched against the war, smoked weed, made and sold candles on the street, etc. Moving forward, I started my family and continued our Chinese tradition, including when my children were born, we had a celebration, the red egg and ginger party. As getting married in the Chinese culture is a big deal, having a baby is a big deal too. The celebration focuses on wishing long life and prosperity for the child. Today, we continue the traditions like gathering at our ancestors' grave to pay our respects, family reunion of our grandmother's family, and celebrating the Chinese New Year with dinner gatherings and passing out red envelopes to our children. So, where did I go after Ming Huang? <laughs> In 1961, I returned to San Francisco to start the ninth grade at Pelton Junior High. 
One of the first days, there were four girls sitting at the small table in home economics class. This black girl said to me, I don't want any chinks at my table. After class, she followed me out the hall and stepped on my heels and repeatedly called me a chink. Well, I was provoked again and I had to take a stand. I put down my books, grabbed the girl by her dress, threw her against the lockers, pulled back her dress, and the back buttons went flying. I picked up my books and said, I'll meet you down at the principal's office. Darn, my mom was gonna get called again. Also, the high school that I was my next stop had a re reputation for being really tough. Gangs, knives, and guns. Oh no, I can't go there. My sister attended Lowell High School, an all-district academic college preparatory public school, so I applied. My grades were a solid D average. I was rejected. I recalled my sessions with Mrs. Johnson at the Ming Wong home. We played games and puzzles. On our last session, she said, Janet, it seems your grades are not what they could be. Do you know you are very bright? You have an IQ of 147. Not many people in that category. Wow. I did not recall anyone giving me a compliment, let alone telling me that I was smart. I requested Ming Huang and Law Status School District to send my records to Lowell. I then wrote a letter, Dear Lowell High School, my daughter has emotional problems. Please give her a chance. Signed, Mrs. Helen Chang. Thank you. I was accepted into Lowell High School. Lowell compared to the previous high school was like Lowell compared Los Gatos. Lowell compared to the, my previous school was like Los Gatos compared to my neighborhood. Lowell's culture was polite and civilized. There were no fights or profanity. As Lo Los Gatos was small town USA, my neighborhood was a battleground. Adult life. My big sister, Deanna or Didi, was my best friend and served as my role motto in life. I have two children, Janine and Tyler. My sister enjoyed being, loved being an elementary school teacher, especially in kindergarten. She had a curious mind as we were always exploring and she inspired me to be open to new experiences. My big sister passed away at 43. She left two children, Roxanne 15 and Peter 11. Her death devastated our family and me. I could not imagine my family without Dee Dee. My world changed and I had to become a different person in order to keep the family together. I gathered the kids together as often as possible and the cousins became even closer. We spent all the school holidays, summers and vacations together. Today, my children are 41 and 51 and my niece and nephew are 48 and 46. I have two grandchildren and my niece has two sons and they call me Yipa, which means second mother of the mother, which means a grandmother. So I have a little poem, grief, is a reminder that love was present and that even though it's no longer in its original form, that love still exists. My education and career. After Lowell High School, I followed my big sister Dee Dee and attended San Francisco City College as college tuition was free in 1965. Later, I earned a baccalaureate from nurse, in nursing from San Jose State University, and then in 1999, a master's in public health. In the 1980s, our family moved to Saratoga, and while my kids in school, I focused on activities in their school, the PTA, community service, fundraising, and initiated an after-school program partnering with the YMCA. After 25 years out of being the workforce, I went to work part-time as a school nurse. My supervisor, M. Thomas, called me to her office and reviewed the protocols with me. I started to sweat. I thought I was getting fired. She said that I had a unique perspective for developing solutions for access to health 
and she smiled and said that hiring me was one of the best decisions that she had ever made. In 1998, I received the national award, the Robert Wood Johnson Community Leadership Award for providing uh, access, access to health for better health outcomes. The recognition focused on the following programs, developing the family support program, family support center, 22 programs to streamline the enrollment in for students. Networking for removing tattoos, gang tattoos called the Clean Slate Program. The first Take Your Daughter to Work Day and activities for homeschool for the boys. And my, my favorite, the first McKinley Act Homeless Assistance Program in California, linking shelters, schools, and social services. For this award, I was invited to Washington, D.C. to receive the award. I had lunch with Senator Barbara Boxer, Senator Dianne Feinstein, and Representative Tom Campbell. Reflecting on the development and success of the programs, it was a collaborative team effort. I was immensely proud of my award and was grateful to my supervisor, M. Thomas, and the team for their enthusiastic support. In 1991, when I completed my public health, I was accepted as a director of health services at San Jose City College. My responsibility was the clinic and meeting the health needs and I developed program to meet those needs. We had, um, we had many, many programs for the homeless, STI and reproductive needs, tobacco education and, and uh, cessation programs. The health services team, including a family physician, registered nurses, medical assistants, licensed psychologists, and health educators. The San Jose City College Health Services Program became a model for, service, for health services for the 117 California community colleges. As a director of the health services, San Jose City College and tenured professor, the position was immensely rewarding as I worked with a dedicated team and the responsibilities were congruent with my personal values of equity and access. I retired from that position in 2018. Believing in community colleges as the access for all, and with my experience at San Jose City College, I decided to run for Board of Trustees of the West Valley Mission College Community College District. My intention was to bring to the board a perspective of the direct workings of the college and of student needs. I was a novice in politics and had a dream. And with many people, my campaign manager, a close knit of family and friends, all supporting me along the way. It was a learning experience. I lost by a narrow margin to a third term candidate, but was immensely proud of my endorsements from the Santa Clara County Democratic Party, the faculty of the West Valley Community Colleges, and the Democratic Activists for Women Now, Dawn an organization fund founded by Barbara Boxer to support women candidates for their office, for running for office. On 2018, when I retired, and now I now have the opportunity to choose where to spend my energy and expertise. In retirement, I carefully chose purposeful, value, purposeful activities that reflected my personal values and philosophy. My volunteer activities include tutoring emergent readers in the national program called Reading Partners, activities including supporting female candidates, including increasing access for women for success, including financial and leadership workshops through the American Association of University Women, facility, facilitating and tutoring students for US citizenship, under the Santa Clara County Public Health Department, I do contact tracing for COVID-19. And I am also a membership of the Butter Paddle Auxiliary, the nonprofit which the proceeds assist needy families and children of the Santa Clara Valley. Ming Huang is one of the components of Uplift, which is the umbrella national organization. As a member of the Butter Paddle organization, I have come full circle from being a resident at the Ming Kwong home to a volunteer contributing to the next generation. 
My life story could probably have turned out very differently if I had not lived on Loma Alta Avenue, Ming Kwong home in Los Gatos for those critical years. Due to my lack of social skills and resulting behavior, the other choice could have been juvenile hall. It is my belief that if I had been sent to the hall, I have no doubt that I would be dead or still in jail. From my time at the home, I learned many things about the world and about myself. I expanded my toolbox of reacting not with anger, but with social civility. The Los, the Los Gatos community seemed nice and even kind. I learned to listen, say hello, please, thank you, and excuse me. I also learned that in spite of my poor grades and poor organizational skills, I was bright. It was an awakening moment when Mrs. Johnson said, Janet, you're very bright. It was the first time I could recall that anyone provided a positive comment to me. Wow, Mrs. Johnson, thank you so much. In addition, during those years at the home, I learned to set a table, make a bed, swim, twirl a baton, and play tennis. As a, as a teenager, tennis was my first sports I became competent in, and the fat feeling began to give me confidence. In fact, tennis is my lifelong sport. I'm proud to have 520 USTA matches under my belt, and at the age of 73, I'm still playing tennis three or four times a week. The skills gained from my time at the home provided me the confidence and hope and propelled me towards a college preparatory public high school and college. Attending that particular high school was another critical stepping stone. I earned a baccalaureate in nursing and later a master's degree in public health and retired as a college professor. I want to thank you to Daniel Keo and Grace Song and the Law Status History Project. Everyone has a story. Thank you very much for listening to mine. I hope you found my story valuable and relevant. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing. That was wonderful. Uh, so I guess uh, when we had talked a couple weeks ago, you mentioned that your family is mentioned in a book. Um, oh. Chinese gold. My family? Yeah. Okay, my family is in this book called Chinese Gold, mm -hmm. and we are one of the first families that were documented that everybody in the family was born in the United States. Wait. Uh, yeah. It's, yeah, yes. this picture. Uh, it's this picture. Right there, yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll, set, I'll take a picture and send it to you. And, it, and in those days, but the caption says, you know, it, it, it tells that this Kwok family, okay, that we're, they were all born here, and they named the men, okay, something Kwok, something Kwok, something Kwok. And then on the right-hand side, <laughs> it says, which was my grandmother, female Kwok, female Kwok. <laughs> so there's, there's no mention of the female name, only of the male name. So, so we're, we're, we're in this book, and uh, 1960, the... The date of our family was 1960 they were, that we were born here. And where was your father? Um, he, he was born in China, correct? My, my father was born in China, but he left China. He, what they did was he jumped on a ship, and he landed in Hawaii. And um, I remember seeing pictures of him in Hawaii, and it really look, looked primitive. But he didn't have a birth certificate, so he said, he said, okay, he just stated, I was, I'm, I'm Hawaiian, okay? So when he applied for a job, he just wrote, I was born in Hawaii, and that was it. And that, that was before, obviously, before Hawaii was a state, but so that's how he went around the world and, and got his first job. But he, he, he was born in China, really. And, and, and my and, mother was born in San Francisco. Gotcha, okay. Um, and I did have a question. Uh, you mentioned your family farm, maybe of your grandfather. My. Um, a family farm, maybe in Monterey. Oh, yes, yes. So what happened was um, 
in, in those days, if somebody wanted your property, they would just burn it down. So my grandmother and grandfather moved from the Monterey uh, Peninsula to Tipperon. And in Tipperon, that area was very much like the area in Monterey. It was on the ocean, I mean, on the, on the bay, and they had chickens and goats and, and trees, and they had a dock where they fished. It, it was a farm. It was a farm. And um, then when um, my grandfather died, uh, my mother, my grandmother could not own the property. It was just reverted to I don't know who. So they, and it was in 1935 before the, um, the Gold Gate Bridge was built. So my grandmother and the children ferried across to San Francisco, to San Francisco Chinatown. And I remember Mr. Johnson, he was next door to my grandmother's farm. He came to visit my grandmother and he described how that area was changed. His, his area still remained a farm, but everybody else was being, uh, was, was making uh, elaborate houses with swimming pools and he deeply resented the poor use of the land, okay? And, uh, and in fact, the funny thing, he came to visit my mother. He was in overalls. He really did look like a, he really did look like a farmer. <laughs> so, um, so that was our, we, we knew that. We, that, that they, uh, we have, there's some pictures of uh, my aunt picking fruit uh, on that farm, but they had chickens and things, goats and things like that there. Yeah. So moving from the farm to Chinatown was an abrupt uh, change for them because everybody lived in very, very small quarters in, in Chinatown. Yeah, it seems like both you and your mother and <laughs> father and grandparents all dealt with those abrupt changes um, yes. kind of constantly. Yeah. yeah. I, I think as I look back at where I am now, I, I think my... In, in like all generations, we do things so that the next generation would have a better chance. And um, I think my mother and father would be proud of where we are and where our grandchildren are because, and, and part of it was through education. All of us uh, got, my sister was a school teacher, I was a nurse, and um, that allowed us to have the, the uh, and the next generation, they're all educated. And I, I did have one more question. How did you, because um, I know that a lot of the women who, who went to Ming Guang have kept in contact. How did you initially get back into contact with a bunch of the women from Ming Guang? I never really talked about Ming Guang to a lot of people because, you know, what am I going to say? I was sent away because I was a bad girl, okay? But, but my kids knew this. So what happened was there was a, um, a book reading with Nona at the San Mateo Library. So my, my nephew said, Auntie, you, you should go there. So I went there and I met Nona and Nona and I got together for lunch and we were just chatting, we were just chatting. And, uh, she, and she's a lovely, gracious woman. And so what happened was I turned out to be in this, in one of her books, there's a chapter of me, in 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 this book so that i was i was quite uh i was quite flattered that she would uh take my story and and include me in this book so since then from 1915 when i met her and then 2017 i met the other ladies and in, in fact um what we're trying this other girl elena wong and i we are trying to we are in the process with um unity to uh, correct the inaccurate history of Ming Kuang. Because when you Google Ming Kuang, it says that we were all prostitutes <laughs> or children of prostitutes, which is like totally wrong, okay? Who started that rumor? So th we're, we're still continuing, um, we're still continuing that, uh, we're, we're working on changing and correcting that um myth yeah that's that's good to hear and it's important i think projects like this highlight that um Secret. until people can tell their own story there there can be well, really inaccurate it's very 
embarrassing if someone says you were from the home, but were you a prostitute or, uh, or your parents? I go, no. Okay. But, but that originally though, that was in the 1900s. Okay. You know, we, we, that, that certainly was not our, um, our group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Grace, did you have any questions? I can also bring up the slideshow. And, yeah. yeah, I do have uh, one question. I know last time we talked, uh, you talked a little bit about what it was like raising children, your, your kids in this area, like kind of the Saratoga region. Um, did you want to talk a little bit about that for this interview? Well, sure. So, um, the first house we bought was a little condo and um, and I, I only had one child at the time. And we did live there very long and it was fine. And I do remember somebody coming up to my house and saying, do I do laundry? And I went, what are you talking about? And, and she had seen me come with a laundry basket from another house because my washing machine and dryer hadn't arrived yet. But I, I really resented that because she thought she was gonna hire me to do laundry. And so I said, I said, I said, no. And, and what happens is I had to modulate my reaction to things like that and not necessarily respond in anger or respond with whatever, but, but just politely say, no, no. Yeah. And then later we moved to Saratoga, which is a very insulated upscale area. I, we lived, we were, we were very fortunate and lived in a, a, a big house with a tennis court. And, um, but again, people would say to me, um, do you cook with a walk at home or, uh, say something, say something in Chinese. Okay. And, and under other circumstances, I would really, you know, respond like my, my, my old Bayview Hunter's Point hood and, and, and not very negatively, but I, 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 I tried not to. And, but I, I remember uh, one time we were at Tyler's uh, school and all the mothers were, we were, we were helping with reading and then all the mothers were just lined up on the side. And I can hear one of the other ladies down there and they say, you know, I can't, oh, there were only eight families, eight Asian families in Saratoga at the time. And I heard this lady say, I God, I just hate it when I see these Asian, these Oriental women driving a Mercedes. And I said, oh man, oh. So I leaned forward and I said, oh, really, you saw my new car? Well, it wasn't quite the color I wanted, but I, I like it. A Mercedes is a Mercedes, okay? And then I stepped back, and then she remained quiet. So along the, along the way, there were, there were comments that, here and there. But today, today, <laughs> Saratoga is very uh, diverse now. But in, in those days, it was, it was a little different. It was a little different, yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing. Um, did you want to look through? Oh yeah, what were you gonna say? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. I can sort of I can share these um, photos if you'd like, and you can talk us through them. Okay. All right. Okay, so this is my grandmother's house. the The very first uh, window right there is my grandmother's, uh, it's, it's really supposed to be the living room, but there were four adults living there. So that's where her bed was. So her bed was there and we did have a table there. And, but it was, uh, um, it was public housing. And we all, we all, four adults and three children lived in that house, lived in that place, yeah. And then, uh, okay. This is, this is, we're on the doorstep of one of our relatives' house. This is my mother, who they always say I look very much like because I wore glasses. In fact, um, we, we were so poor that, and my eyes were so bad <laughs> that when my mother took me to the doctor, she says, what's wrong with her? She's always bumping into things. And it turns out I was so far, farsighted that, and we were so, so poor I qualified for this program called 
uh, Crippled Children's Council. So every year I got new glasses. So every year I went to this place downtown, I had my eyes examined and I got new glasses. So my, my mother has glasses. I was the only one that really wore glasses. This is my big sister, Deanna. This is my brother, uh, Walton, and this is me as a baby. Yeah, th this, this looks like a nice house, and it was a nice house compared to living in a closet in Chinatown. So this was, uh, uh, this was our, our living room and, uh, and one car garage, and we had uh, three bedrooms and one bath. <laughs> three bedrooms. And we had a backyard, and my father grew um, uh, orchids. He built a um, hothouse, and he grew orchids, and we had an apricot tree. And my favorite thing was to ride my bicycle all over town. I rode my bicycle. I was very, uh, I was very much of a tomboy. I watched uh, Candlestick Park being built and uh, I just, I would just ride my bicycle all over town. It was a, it was, I, it was quite fun, yeah. Janet, did you mention, ever mention what your father did? My, my father worked, he was, uh, uh, he, he was a merchant marine and his job was the, the laundry and uh, providing uh, bed, uh, beddings and towels and everything to everybody on the ship. So he, he worked, he, the, under the guise of Bertrand Marine, he was really the laundry. He was a laundry man. Uh, this is a picture from the backyard. This is my father. He was quite handsome. This is a lousy picture. Um, be, my, my family home burnt down when in, uh, in the 70s. So we have no, we have very few pictures of our family. So this is my father. This is my mother. Uh, this is my older sister, Deanna. This is my brother, Walton. This is me. This is my sister, Tina. And this is my baby brother, Wilbert. So there were five of us. And my, my father was very, uh, my father's favorite and everybody's favorite was my sister. My sister was like sunshine. She was, uh, she smiled. She was, uh, uh, she, she was, she was wonderful. She was friendly. She was, uh, everybody loved Dee Dee. Well, this is me and Dee Dee. <laughs> this, this is, can you believe this? This, this is a stroller. <laughs> you, you can't tell, but it's so old. This is a stroller. So there's the handlebar there and there's me and my, my sister. Yeah. We, um, I say this, but I, I know you're not going to believe this because everybody does it until they see another picture. I, I was really a very ugly child. I, 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 was, I, I jokingly say I was the ugly baby. And, and one of the pictures that we had, but which is burned when our house burned down, we lost, my, was all these pictures on, on, the, um, on, a, on a table. And my picture was the only picture that I'm not, that that the kids not smiling. I I look like a dirty sock thrown into a corner, and and that's what I look like. I was just I was just so homely and so ugly. But look at my sister. My sister is sunshine. <laughs> so when you're ugly, you live a different life. Okay. So this this picture because I mean, people treat you differently. So this picture, my 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 girlfriend sent it to me. This picture, I, ever, I tell everybody I was an ugly baby. They go, nah, nah, nah. Nobody can believe it. I said, okay, pick me out in this picture. And they go, oh, this is you. I said, no. This is you. I said, no. Is this you? I said, no. I said, look for the ugly baby. And sure enough, this is me. My mother experimented on my hair. I had thick glasses. I had mismatched clothes. Oh, my God. I was so pathetic. So pathetic. Yeah. Is anyway, this you in the where are you? I'm right and right very much in the middle. Looks like my glasses are cracked. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you laughing, Daniel. <laughs> okay, so ironically, ready for this? Remember that girl I beat up and I pulled her dress and all the buttons flew? This is her. This is the, this is this so on your left? Yeah, this is our picture from fourth grade. But this girl, she didn't remember me when I came back to Pelton in the ninth grade. And she was the one that said, no chinks at my table. So I, I beat her up anyway. But ironically, she's sitting next to me in the picture. <laughs> Shoulders uh, touching and everything. Like I there's was nothing. I was <laughs> we followed Grace. No wonder my mother sent me away. She was exhausted. <laughs> 
Well, you look fine here to me. So I, mean, <laughs> I don't see any ugliness. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you're being kind. Well, just to ex just to give you an example. Of, in this picture, you see the diversity. See here, special ed. This girl is Indian. Some of the white kids are not from here. They're from the shipyard, okay? Their, their parents came here temporarily. So the, like, like uh, this kid was from Germany. And so all these other, a lot of these kids were not from the area, but they were from the shipyard. Interesting. Interesting. So this is the gate where the main, or where you entered before. The gate's still there, but the sign isn't there any longer. The interesting thing is, see the, see the young girl, the white girl? Her name is Kathy O'Neill. Her parents were the directors, they were from Canada. Her parents were the directors of the Ming Kwong home when I was there. And her name was Kathy O'Neill. And in fact, I came back to go to her wedding and she lives in Stockton. So sometimes we email back and forth. So yeah, so I sent her this picture if she hadn't, if she had, didn't have it, yeah. Wow. Is that you on the right? No. There are no pictures of me. I okay, told you, okay. because I was ugly. Who <laughs> would want an ugly baby in their picture? <laughs> <laughs> this is the, the, uh, like the cottage that I lived. There, there are three cottages. This is the, uh, the second one. The first one is called the, uh, uh, I can't remember. It's for little kids. And they, they were like two major rooms that they slept in a dormitory style. This co is cottage for the older girls that I lived in. And uh, it, this was the living room, and the first bedroom was, was mine. I, I had somebody else in the bedroom, too. There were two of us in each bedroom. Uh, is this the same structure? Like, this is what it looked like when you were living there? Kind of. This fence wasn't there. This was all open land. There, there, this, there was not a parking lot there. Mm -hmm. This is all open land. And, uh, but, but essentially, the same structure is there. Okay. This is a main house. This has changed a lot because the main house used to have what used to be uh, wooden uh, shingles. Okay, but structurally the main house is the, still pretty much pretty much the same. We uh, there was a there was a library here. There's a living room with a beautiful view outside. There's a downstairs and an upstairs, and then this is where uh, the, the on the top floor. This is where the staff lived. Oh. This is the uh, uh, Los Gatos Presbyterian Church, and um, we would go there every Sunday. We would walk from Ming Kwong, but now there's all these houses there, so you can't walk through that area. But I, I tried to attend this church for a while, but um, there were so few people there, and they were all very elderly so it didn't seem relevant to me but um i still consider myself a christian but i i still haven't found i, I never found a place that i really liked but th that's the church that we that i went to when we were at the home um this is old town but this is where university avenue this is where my middle school was so structurally it's still the same okay and in fact um uh, um to the left of this picture there is the auditorium which is which was our uh which was our school auditorium and and then there's a restaurant here called the wine cellar where you go downstairs and um that's where we dress for PE. <laughs> it still exists. If you go down to the wine cellar, that's, that was where the, the girls uh, uh, dressed. And then uh, PE was we, we, walked across, we walked across the bridge, walked across 17, and there was a field. And that's where we played basketball and um, uh, had track and things like that. Yeah. But, is that, I'm oh, sorry, is that where the high school is now? No, the... the this yeah yeah that's right it's the back like the part of the high school, school. Yeah. You're right it's the back part of the high school but this it was the middle school that I attended and um which is now Old Town in fact when I came back to Saratoga I took a cooking oh there it is this is the auditorium of the school on all this part here was the playground was the front yard it was just where we played in, in and the 
and uh, there used to be bigger trees there. But um, when I came back to Saratoga as an adult, I just lived down the street from the community center and I took a cooking class and I saw this lady there and I said, um, is your name Mrs. Mattingly? She says, yes, dear. And I said, um, did you used to teach at University Avenue? She says, um, I taught at Fisher. And then she looked at me again and she said, I did teach at University Avenue. And are you Janet Chang? I had shivers. I said, how did you remember? She says, you always remember your first class. And she was such a lady. I just, she was probably one of the few teachers that, that treated me nicely. But she said that um, she, she was a graceful uh, lady. And, and uh, so it was fabulous running into her as an adult again. And she remembered us and she remembered me. She goes, you always remember your first class. Well, anyway, that was a, uh, that was a good year. My, my uh, seventh grade, that was a good year. That's so funny that you were able to connect with her so many years later. Yeah. <laughs> so that's Louise Van Meter. It, it, in fact, it looks the same with when it was built. I think it was built in, in the 50s or the early 60s. It looks exactly the same. Yeah. And this is my Chinese name. And uh, it means Jang Siltal. And oh, no, no, it's just being Chang and then the family name. And so uh, uh, someone gave it to me as a gift on my 60th birthday. They had it done in China. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. This is my mom and dad. And uh, we go there every year and we clean off the, um, the headstone. And uh, yeah. So I lost my father when I was very young. I was only in my 20s. And then I lost my mother when I was 40. And uh, so it, this is, it's so, uh, yeah, yeah, we've, we've been without grandparents for a long time. Yeah. Which cemetery this is? This is, this is, um, I can't remember, but it's a Cyprus, Cyprus. Okay. And, um, but my in fact, I should have included it. My grandmother and grandfather, the Quokside, they're in the Chinese cemetery. And, and uh, I'll send you a picture of her headstone. And uh, she, she, my grandfather died very early. I can't remember when, but my grandmother died in the 60s. Yeah. My mother's mother. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful headstone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're very proud. They, they were, uh, they, they really tried, tr they really tried their best to, uh, to um, help us grow up. Yeah. yeah. Noticing a lot of these last names are like Cantonese last names. Yes, yes, there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this is my sisters, uh, Deanna, May Yi. Deanna Chang, Deanna May Chang Yi, and uh, she was the center of our family, and uh, we we all we all still uh, grieve in many ways and miss her miss her dearly, yeah. Um, where where is this? Sa same same um, same cemetery. She's in what they call the Hall of Flowers. Uh, so she doesn't have a, a tombstone uh, headstone outside, but she's in the Hall of Flowers. But the same. So what I, was, I bought a niche on that same wall, so our family could go to see mom and dad, and our family could go and see my sister and I. It's very nice. This is a picture of me when I ran for public office. I really was scared, but I really wanted to do something really special. So uh, this is my picture from the, my campaign. And uh, can you remind me what year that was? Um, 2016. And this is my uh, grandson at the time. Uh, he was very little. He was only a couple of years old. And um, he, was, he was my, uh, my, my secret charm because I would take him around everywhere. And everyone would say, oh, you're so cute. Oh, you're so cute. <laughs> but he was a, he was a delight. He's, he's eight now. Did I say that right? It must be, must be more than that. 
was it 2000? I can't, okay. So well, if he's eight I'm now. 14. Okay, so maybe 2014, yeah. <laughs> I can't even count. Oh, it's there. Oh, Look yeah, it says it. Um, the sign says 2014. <laughs> oh, oh, Daniel, you're, 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 you're. <laughs> used to research yeah. Yeah. It, was a, it was a really it was a really good experience but you know I became people say why don't you run again I said I'm too old but I will help other other people run for office yeah and that's what I've been doing that's great ah. and this is the group from uh, to the 2017 uh, reunion and um, this is uh, that's the new museum right Say it again. This is at the new museum of Las Gatos. Yes, yes, okay. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so this is the artist here. Uh, you know, Dale. D Darren is part of uh, Unity, uh, and she was. I think she was the curator. She did something apart with that. Had to do with the. Uh, um, yes. Yeah. yeah. I think her name is Amy something. I forget her last name. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So here's a side story. You see this person right here? Okay. This is a throwback, okay? I met her and I thought I didn't know who she was. And she said, Janet, don't you remember me? I'm Virginia. And it gave me chills because she was a friend of my mother's and she even lived with my mother for a long time. And then my mother became scared of her. And she says, Janet, well, she really called my sister. She, she told Dee Dee, she says, I'm, I'm afraid of Virginia. She, she yells at me and I'm afraid of her. So what I did was I brought boxes. I brought garbage bags. My sister and I went to my mother's place and I told this girl, I said, you have two hours to pack your shit and get out of here. I will, I will call a cab for you. I will you know, move you up, but do not ever come back or I will kick you. I will, you know, so, so that was the last time I saw her when I kicked her out of my mother's house. And then I see her here. I said, oh God, this is, so we never talked about it and I stay away from her because I, I, I don't want to bring up my anger from that time. But uh, oh, the, I, I, gave, I gave her some money. I gave her money for uh, either a hotel or a place to go, whatever, but I gave her money. And I, and I said, you need to pack your things and get out now. Yeah, my, my mother's safety is our priority and not you. So, and why did she, why was she at this event? What kind of relation does she have with Ming Huang? She's one of the sisters. She grew up with these ladies there. Oh, she was okay. She's one of the older um, okay. yeah. generation. Gotcha. I had, yeah, is, is that freaky or what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, to this day, I don't know why she was sent there, uh, but uh, I, I, I try not to inter, interact with her because oh, I don't know what I would really say. But anyway, all these ladies are, are, are very nice. And uh, this is Elena that her and I are trying to correct the, up, uh, the records. Yeah. So Elena's the one in the magenta dress, right? Yes, yeah, Elena okay. Wong, yeah. yeah. And um, could you maybe name some of the other folks that Let's you see. know? This is, this is Dolly Jang. Wh which one is Dolly Jang? In the red, I'm, I'm going to go from the right to the left. Okay, okay. So in the red jacket is Dolly Jang. Uh, let's see. I can't remember her name. In fact, this is really bad because she even stayed at my house. I can't remember her name. I can't, you know, uh, I can't remember. You know what I'm going to do? Uh, you can get back to us with that. I, I, will send it, I, I, will, I will write down all the names and get back to you. Sure. Yeah, yeah no, no problem. problem. Yeah. Uh, it's great that everyone was able to gather for that um, Yeah, and, that, and what they do is they invite us to um, uh, their big luncheon every year. And, um, and they, yeah, so it's, 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 been, it's been a good experience for me or else I, I would never have uh, connected so much with I'm the only one that lives in this area. I'm, I, yeah, everybody else lives uh, Sacramento, San Francisco, all, all over. So yeah, uh, uh, some of them live as far away as uh, uh, New York and yeah. Uh -huh. 
Now this, this girl's name is Helen. <laughs> it's coming back to me. This girl in the back, her name is Helen. Helen and Dale, they, they know each other. They live in San Francisco. Ooh. Yeah. Um, oh. uh, this lady is Lanny Silver. She's the one that inspired Steven Spielberg to, to, uh, to make the movie Schindler's List. She worked for a nonprofit and so did I. And so we communicated back and forth. And then we realized we went to high school together. <laughs> but um, she, she passed away very soon after, very, very shortly after this picture. It was really very, very sad. She, uh, yeah. But she's a, a, a very passionate lady about, about, um, about history. And uh, she was very nice. Yeah, Lanny Silver. And there's me. They, she, we were on the uh, uh, picture. We were on the in the newspaper, and people said, "Are is that you?" I go, "Yeah," but apparently the reporter didn't want my face. He just wanted my back. <laughs> and and this was a, a uh, not to say that having an award is a big deal, but what happens is you go along doing your work, and then someone recognizes you, or people say, "Wow, wow, wow." And so this was this was really confirmation of my of our our work. And you can never say I did this, I did that, but rather it was really a, a team effort, te a team effort. Just just one story about how um, connections make a big deal. So I was a school nurse, and I um, there was a young man. He was in a, a gang, and he had tattoos on his face. And I said, well. He says, well, he wanted them removed because he wanted to go get a job. And every time people looked at him, they were afraid. So I said, well, do you have health care coverage? He says, yeah, I belong to Kaiser. I said, oh, yeah, go to dermatology and Kaiser will use a laser and remove them. So next time I saw him, he said, um, they said, no, they said removing them is cosmetic and they would charge me. So I said, huh, let me work on this. So I lived in Saratoga at the time, and I'm at the local grocery store, and I run into this guy that I play tennis with, and he happens to be the president of the Santa Clara Medical Society and the physician in chief at Kaiser, okay? So I say, hey, Roger, I need your help, okay? He sent a student to dermatology to get his tattoos removed. They said, it's, cos it's cosmetic, we can't do it. He, he stopped picking out green onions. He turned to me and he said, Janet, perfect. This is what we want to do. Let's get together a group, of, a group of like Stanford and Valley Medical and Kaiser, and we will together have a project about removing gang tattoos. I said, fabulous. So we got together, we were on CNN, we were on national about, it's called um, Clean Slate Program. And it's part of the mayor's program now and other, other, um, other cities have adopted it. But it just shows that not one person can do it. So given the right time, the right connections, magic can happen. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's great. It's great when we're able to use our influence um, in that way. So this is my tennis. And, and the reason why tennis is so important to me is because, well, there's the exercise, there's the tennis camaraderie, but it's also about that continuing this, my, my, te my tennis, and I, I feel great about it because this is the one thing, not school, not all this other stuff, this is the one thing that I think I have competence that excel at. And being on a team is really important. It's really important for, so it confirms and, and it, it's just it's just great fun. And so, in fact, I miss it because none of us can play USGA. So this whole group, you know, we would see each other like several times a week and then play matches and then several times a week again. And then we would go away for like, um, like districts or sectionals or whatever. It was, uh, it's, it's, it's just, team is just really important. And this was important to me, yeah. And I learned to play tennis. When I was in Los Gatos at the Los Gatos um, High School, yeah. In fact, I was on the high school tennis team, not because I was very good in those days, but because so few people know how to keep score, okay? So 
I was on the tennis team because I knew how to keep score, even though I wasn't very good. No. See, there's, uh, so we were at sectional championships. So this is how we got, uh, we excelled. And there's my, I was a, a captain of the, she, I was, she was a captain and I was a co-captain. So you don't have to include all these pictures. I just want people to get a, a, a picture, an idea of, of where I've evolved. That's great. And it's, uh, it's great to see the, the ways that you've interacted and formed community through, through that sport. This is the Quok reunion. Uh, Sorry. What happened? Again. Oh, that was my fault. There we go. So what happened was um, there was, there's a lady, the, my cousin's named Pat Chin, and she's famous because she has this dancing group called Grand Avenue Follies. And so in one year, we had three funerals of our cousins, not, not of our aunts and uncles, but of our cousins, okay? So we said from now on, we were going to go to all the funerals, no matter where they were. So we ended up going to, um, we ended up going to Las Vegas and, uh, and we met, uh, let's see, where is he? His name is Travis, where's Travis? Uh, huh, how come I can't find him? Let's see. Let's see. Maybe he took the picture. Well, here's his wife. Oh, here he is, right here. So I had never met Travis, and he's my nephew. His mother was my first cousin. So we went to Las Vegas for this memorial service, and they were blown away because we brought a whole bunch of people from San Francisco. I brought myself. I brought my, my cousin, I brought my niece, I brought a whole, we brought a whole contingency. We, in fact, our group was bigger than their group. <laughs> but they were so surprised when we were, when they, when we asked around, like, who are you? Because they didn't know who we were. So then we decided to do a quack reunion. And so this is, this is our quack reunion for this year, for last year. And then um, we ended up uh, uh, going to the, um, cemetery and doing the uh, usual traditional burning of the incense and things like that. So it was, it was quite fun. Uh, it was, and, and to, to, to do for all the, these quacks to meet. So this is my cousin, this is my cousin, and uh, this is my daughter, this is me, uh, this is my nephew, okay, uh, this is my brother, and he only has his son there, Okay, this is my niece, but her her uh, brother isn't there. Yeah, and this is a this is my cousin Pat, and this is her son. Yeah, so we wish it had been bigger, but we were hoping that 2020 would be a bigger group because more people had time. We could contact people, and guess what? Poof, <laughs> COVID hit, <laughs> so we we couldn't. But it was it was fun, and now we have a Facebook page, and so here's the Quack reunion from last year. Oh, that's great. And your, your mom's last name is Kwok, right? No, my mom's last name was Chan. Oh, okay, okay. Because Kwok was my grandmother's name. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And I try to get everybody together as much as possible. So this is a birthday, and I think it's my daughter's birthday. I think it's my daughter's and my son's birthday. Not my daughter and my nephew's birthday. And so most of the time we have it at my house, but this, this time we decided to have it at North Beach. So, you know, we, we're kind of silly. We get together. This is my niece, and, and her brother is not in the picture. And, okay, this is my, uh, okay, let's see, where's my, uh, Roxanne, this is my niece. And Peter, this is my nephew. This is my son, Tyler, and my daughter, Janine. And then uh, my son's wife is back here. She's a little camera shy. And, and this, is the, this is my son's son, uh, uh, Brian. A everybody loves him, so everybody wants to hold him. And, okay, so where's my niece? Okay, so here's my niece. And this is her husband over here. And this is, her two sons are Jet, and Mason, and Jet is in college, and Mason now is in high school. So we try to get everybody together for birthdays, um, all the holidays, things like that. 
But then again, COVID, poof, no birthday parties, not nothing. I don't think we're going to have Thanksgiving, obviously. Yeah. But I try to be as, um, I try to do what my sister would have done. And my sister was always bringing everybody together. Yeah. In, in fact, in the house we're in, uh, my, my husband and I, we wanted a big enough house that we could have everybody. So we have this giant family room that has, we, and we have a table that's 128 inches long. <laughs> so we could fit a lot of people. It's probably longer than this table. Yeah. So, but we take off the two leaves and it's a normal table. But um, we try to get everybody together as much as possible. Oh, this is my sister-in-law, Victoria. Victoria and her, her mother was the oldest person in our house for a long time. Her mother, uh, they're German. Her mother was called Obi, which means grandmother in Germany, in German. And um, she always said prayers before dinner and, and we miss her, we miss her very much. And we miss my brother who was her partner. He, my brother died when he was only 49. Yeah, so uh, very sad. So we keep in touch. We make sure that everybody's together. It's very nice. So this is another group of uh, a family getting together in my, my old house. And uh, I, I lived in a house that had, uh, we were a condo. We had a swimming pool a couple of doors down. So everybody came to my house and we, this is 4th of July. And so it's, it, we, it was a place of, to gather. So no matter what, everybody came to Aunt, Aunt Janet's house. Yeah. Um, this is about Chinese heritage again. This is a, for every year, the Chinatown YMCA uh, has a, a lunar run, a Chinese run, which runs from Chinatown to North Beach through uh, um, financial district and home. So Bryant loves to do it. So, so here's, my, here's my partner, Carl, there's my grandson, and this young lady is Carl's niece. So we, we try to do this every, every year. So this particular year, we got medals for it. So um, it, it's always fun and we, we see, we, I see a lot of my old friends when I do this because a lot of them come out to run. But at, at, at 73, there's only like five, five people in my category <laughs> when I run. But anyway, it's, it's still fun and it's, uh, it's something we do as a family. I think that's, oh, so this is all the grandchildren. This is Jet. Mason, and then uh, uh, Brian and his little sister. His little sister now is uh, three. And he's eight, he's 21, and he's 16, yeah. That's awesome, I think that's all of the photos. Okay. So, what do you oh. think, Daniel? <laughs> this has uh, been really you're great. You're exhausted. <laughs> no, thank you so much. I did wanna add, um, just in case this gets recorded, um, I wanted to say for everyone who's listening, um, at the end of this video, we're going to attach another video um, that Janet made through our um, through the California State Library's California Listens program. She created a, a digital storytelling video, sort of um, going through some of her experiences at Ming Kwong and, and beyond that. Um, so it's, it's a pretty short video. I think it's only about like five minutes long or so. Um, so that will sort of take place at the end of this one. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Was, it's almost four o'clock, you guys. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I know. Was there anything else that you wanted to add or finish I am on? totally fine. You know about me that me that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I thank you for all your support, all your suggestions your recommendations all your help technology wise uh but most of all uh, for your encouragement i i really I, I couldn't have done it without you i couldn't have done it without you we pulled up to a driveway there was a giant wooden gate curving upward and across the top it read the Ming Kwong home. As far back as I could remember I would get into trouble. In my Bayview neighborhood we were Asian, Blacks, Italians and newcomers from the shipyards. 
Someone called me a chink or bucktooth, and I would threaten. When you walk home, look on three corners, I will be on one of them and chase your ugly ass down. The school principal would frequently call my mother and once again suspend me for fighting in school. Something had to give. So there I was, the Ming Kwong home, 50 miles away in Los Gatos Hills. Where the hell am I? Landing at the Ming Kwong home was like landing on another planet. In this new town, everyone was helpful and friendly. If I was accidentally bumped, they would offer a polite, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. The Ming Kwong home provided me with counseling sessions and this one lady who played games with me in the library. I always looked forward to Mrs. Johnson's visits as she was fun and seemed to like me. I spent three years there. I was different, but still went back to my old self. I got into a fight or two in middle school and knew if I went to Mission High School, I was doomed. I recalled that Mrs. Johnson said that I was smart, that I had an IQ of 147. I applied to Lowell, the academic high school in San Francisco. Had Ming Kwong send my records, I composed a letter as my mother to Lowell. Please give my daughter a chance. She has emotional issues. Thank you, Mrs. Helen Chang. I was accepted, my life changed. I went on to become a registered nurse with a BS and a master's degree in public health. I retire now after 20 years as faculty member and clinic director at San Jose City College. But I still remember that place in the Los Gatos Hills. I stepped through the gate deeply flawed, and by the time I left, I had a direction forward. <laughs>